put you on the radio. Yeah, you gotta get on the radio. You gotta get on the radio. Welcome back to Around the House with Eric Cheeks. This is where we talk home improvement. For you listening, this is hour number two. But don't fret if you're just joining us. Our number will be up on the podcast just in a few minutes. So you can grab it there anywhere you catch a podcast. I'm Eric G. I'm Dane V. And we're having a good time here in the studio. Give us a call, 503-417-9595. 503-417-9595. We're having fun on Facebook, too, so make sure you like and follow us over there. We've had this poll questions running all week. There's seven of them. I put one up a day this last week here. Why don't you take a look? We got some ties right now. Like right now, we got a tie between one head to head competition here is furniture repair and finish versus deck building. We got a perfectly set tie right there. So I don't know what we're going to do if we got ties. Those are so, good, two good options, by the way. To put exactly. Up yeah. I'm throwing some. I, didn't, I wanted to make them hard, you know? <laughs> Let's see what we got going there. So we got a lot of good stuff up there on the Facebook page. So join in up there. As well as I had a fun post this week. I don't know if anybody caught it up. At the uh, CES show 2019, Kohler launched a smart toilet with built-in Alexa speaker. <sighs> Alexa, courtesy flush, please. I mean, and can you? Uh, no, no. That's, and this has been going on for about a year now, though, isn't it? Yeah. Have they been talking about this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I need Alexa in the bathroom. That, and I, mm-hmm. I mean, all you have to do is reach right behind you to flush. I don't I, see. But here's the thing, too. I don't want Alexa jumping in the middle of this conversation when I'm in the bathroom. If I'm singing along, I don't need an answer. To, I don't need to correct him in my song lyrics in the bathroom. Right. If I'm taking a shower, singing in the shower, I don't need Alexa going, what? What? Hey, Dane, yeah. that's yeah. wrong. Exactly. We don't need this. So, anyway, one of those things that we've got to, uh, we might be jumping the shark a little bit on that one. Sorry, Cooler. Yeah, but it just, I don't i don't see the necessity. I don't see the need for that. Yeah, that's, it, it, that goes a little far for me. Hey, we've got a call in here. Uh, looks like we've got Ron and Cedar Mills. Welcome to Around the House. Yeah, I have a kitchen question. Sure. Um, I, uh, about a decade or two ago, I put in, uh, <clears throat> I had my canvas done with the uh, facing stuff. Okay, so it was refaced? Yeah. Okay. And now uh, some of the um, like trim is peeling off. Yeah. And I like to paint it. Uh, can I get... Uh, how, what, what do I do to uh, re- remove the rest of, this, of the facing? You, you're, in a, you're in a tough spot because you know, refacing traditionally only lasts about five to seven years, you know, when you do a reface versus a replace. And what happens is if you go in there and you put paint over the top of that, you're probably going to release more of the stuff and have a bigger problem. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I was want to take the um, the remaining uh, facing tr- that, that they trim off. You might be able to do that if it's, you know, if you've got that. Did they do a, a very thin paper thin veneer or did they do like the it's a- eighth inch veneers? It's a thin vanilla. Okay. You might be able to get an adhesive remover to take it off there. This is going to be a big and sticky and messy job. It's going to yeah. be very labor intensive no matter how you do it. And you're going to have to use some chemicals uh, as far as that that's going to be not so friendly. So you'll be using like an adhesive remover for that you would see maybe for... It's going to have to release. It's probably, it could be contact cement on there or it could be a peel and stick. Either way, what you might do. It's probably a peel and stick because the uh, uh, stuff that has come off so far has almost been clean. Okay, so here's what I would do first before I'd get into chemical land. I would get in there, and you got to be really careful of this because I don't want to see you burn your house down, but get in there with a heat gun. Yeah, that's what I thought. And hit it with the heat gun first, and the peel and stick might pull off after that. But you are going to probably have to hit it with some kind of good um, cleaner to get that adhesive residue off before you do any painting on it. Yeah, I, I figure that that that, that that'll probably have to sand it a little. Yeah, you're, you definitely want to sand it, but you might want to. I would probably go through and take an adhesive remover. After you get it pulled off, get that off there because all you're going to do is gum up your sandpaper. You'll get a lot more life out of the sandpaper if you yeah. at least go over the top of that one time. Okay. And then when you paint it, make sure you get a good hard surface. So go to your local paint store, whoever you like working with, and get yeah, a cabinetry well, type. I, uh, I, I thought thing. about painting it with the same color paint as I did, I did the walls. 
Yeah, but you don't want to do a regular latex. You need something that's going to be a lot harder for that because it'll wear right off and you're going to have just a bigger mess. Okay, so, so not latex. Well, you can, there are some latex-based cabinetry finishes out there, but I would go talk to... A lot of the good ones are going to be a, a latex slash like urethane finish where they've got a harder finish. Oh, okay. uh, I just did, if you actually go over uh, over to our Facebook page around the house there, G, or even go over to, that's probably the best place to find it. I did a two-part video series for More Good Day Oregon last month that was about how to finish furniture, but I used the Valstar, Valspar brand stuff uh-huh. on there, and it shows kind of what to do on the sanding and, and priming and painting with that. And I don't care if the paint says don't you don't have to use primer. Use a primer. You'll get a better finish. Yeah. So the Valspar stuff says, oh, you don't need to use primer. I'll be honest. Put a primer on there. You'll have a better finish when it's done. Okay. Does that help you? Yeah. All right, Ron. Good luck. And uh, yeah, you can check that video out. It's over on the Facebook page. And I'll post it back up here when we get a chance on Facebook for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for checking us out here and around the house. Good question. And I'm not a big fan of, you know, doing the reface stuff and sorry cabinet refacers out there um i just think in many cases it's something that just it'll hold up for a little while but you can really only do it once and once you've done it you're stuck and now it's hard to hit the reverse button on that and i would much rather see and i know it seems wasteful i would much rather see new cabinets an updated design and stuff because many times i have seen actually the cabinetry cost for refacing be more expensive because of the labor that you have to do for putting those veneers over everything. I've seen it when you're putting countertops in. It's actually cheaper to remove and replace cabinets and countertops than to have it refaced. That's what I was going to ask you, too, because, I mean, uh, when you were first at the beginning of that call, it seemed very labor-intensive to kind of get that, and I'm just like, well, I mean, at that point, go find yourself a new set of cabinets. Well, that you like. yeah, if you think about it, about 70 to 80% of the price of that cabinet is the door and the door fronts. Yeah. So if you're replacing those... And then you've got to put tons of labor into cleaning up and re-skinning all the exposed pieces with a new veneer material. You can fill a dumpster up or give those cabinets away, donate them to Habitat for Humanity or re- you know, restore up to any one of the places here in the Pacific Northwest that take you know, materials like that. You're good. And let somebody else reuse them and then put in the new stuff. That way you get the new drawer runners. You get the new glides and you know with cabinetry you get what you pay for with that so when i put in new cabinetry i like to see things like you know i like to see the hardwood drawer boxes the the soft close drawers and then you can start putting in some design things so that way you can get in there with the um you know you can get in all the trash cans and all the pullout drawers and stuff like that so redesign it take some time do it right and you'll be good to go so Actually, if you want, that's another good point that you're actually making. We do have, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this when we come back. I do have a cabinet source for you out there. Let's talk about that when we come back here. Because I've got a good little sale price out there that they're blowing out a bunch of cabinets. That might save you a couple little dollars. So I'll give you my secret to that just as soon as Around the House returns. Welcome back to Around the House with Eric G. This is where we talk home improvement every Saturday afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm Eric G. I'm Dane Vodder. We're having a good time in here like we always do every Saturday. We are live. We are local. We are the only, we're really the only Northwest non-infomercial home improvement show. Everybody else is on the East Coast. So we're here to represent and help all of us out on this side of the hill. And that's what we do. Gives us a little West Coast perspective on the home improvement. Absolutely. Everything here is not, we got a lot of drywall, not a lot of lath and plaster out this way. So (laughs) there's a lot of different things that we do here that they do just a little bit differently over the other side. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. We're just a little bit different. 503-417-9595. 503-417-9595 is how you get us here in the studio. Now, you say we're a little bit different, and uh, we, we have something that we like to say behind the scenes. We're not your grandpa's home improvement show. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we like to have fun in here. We want you to join us in the conversation, and 
want you laughing a little bit too while we do it. So that's the fun part of this. We've been talking, geez, online on Facebook. We've been having a bunch of different conversations, including Mike. We've been going back and forth with a bunch of different projects. So check us out online at Facebook, Around the House with Eric G, or just type in at ATH. KXL. Now, if you want to share your projects with us, we have a closed groups basically specifically for that. It's called Around the House Nation. It's a closed group. All you got to do is go search Around the House Nation. Ask to be a member of it. We'll add you. Really, the only rule we have is no politics. Absolutely. And everybody has to play nice out there. And uh, so far, everybody's batting a thousand on Absolutely. that one. Absolutely. So good job out there. By the way, this segment is brought to you by Western Construction Systems. They're out at the uh, build remodel landscape show at the Oregon Convention Center this weekend. So go out and check them out out there. They're out there to answer all your questions about earthquake retrofitting, basement waterproofing, drainage systems. They've even got a little display out there, that FRCM system that we were talking about. If you've got a big brick building or block building or you want to even clay tile, you can actually that uh, you can actually earthquake retrofit some of that. So. They've got all their stuff out there at that show. So get the free estimate from them. The integrity of your foundation is their specialty guaranteed, and that is CCB number 94222. (laughs) So we've been talking a little bit about tile and stuff, and I want to get into that. Uh, But if you want to give us a call if you've got something else that uh, you're working on. But here's the thing. Tile is all prep work. A lot of it is just putting together that great foundation underneath it. You can put the highest quality tile down with the greatest grout and if you didn't do the foundational work on that it's all going to come up just going to be broken it's going to be crazy looking and here's the thing i like people to start out with small project with tile maybe you're going to do a backsplash it's the easy way to do it and no i'll be honest i don't like putting tile back up on drywall not my thing i like to take it a little extra step and you can get away with it sometimes in the back But here's the problem. When you put, you've got a drywall backsplash back there, and maybe it's a little rough, everything else, you are relying for that mastiger mortar to stick to that painted surface back there. It's not designed for hanging tile on that. So you got to be careful with that. I like to put, you know, a hardy backer or something back there. It's a little bit more work and actually put up a backing material back there. I'm not a big fan, though, of the concrete hardy backer boards. And this is why when you deal with the, and there's a difference out there, you'll see the different boards of concrete backing material, the stuff that just looks like it's concrete and mesh. There's a few different brands out there of it. I don't like it. It comes apart. So I like the more synthetic companies and I'm not going to endorse in any one of them right now. So that's why I'm being a little vague, but the concrete based looks like it's concrete and fiberglass mesh. That stuff out there is a brand and as a whole, I'm not a big fan of it. I have seen many a times that fail. We had a couple weeks ago, we had a listener out there that had put it down and then didn't put the tile down for a number of years and it was coming apart. My little brother's got a a house that he bought, oh, seven or eight years ago. So about 10 years ago that people had done a really nice master bath renovation. It's a 1909 house. Little bit of flex in that floor. That little bit of flex has caused the backing material that concrete that's you know quarter three eighths thick whatever thick they put it down to break apart so it's still underneath there but when you walk across it it sounds like you're walking on broken glass because it crunch 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 under the tile floor not a fan of that you hear it you can't see it then you know you've got to tear it up you got to tear it up so he's actually got to go through and do a big repair in his mosaic tile floor in this vintage home because it's moved it moved around just a little bit so I like doing stuff that's going to hold up a little bit better. And there's a ton of composite systems out there. I One of my favorites, I use a lot of Schluter products out there for doing stuff because it, it's Weddy's another one, just as good as far as I'm concerned. But all those different brands are great composite backing materials. And here's the thing. If you are going to be diving into a shower, let's say, this is not your normal DIY project. Be careful. This is something... You know, if you've got a five-foot shower and you're going to have a company come in and do it, that's about a $10,000 ask wow. by the time you say start to finish. By the time you put in a, a good shower pan, do the walls right, glass shower door, frame shower door, plumbing, and that stuff in there. So you can't go in and do this. If you do this wrong, you can cause tens of thousands of dollars of damage of water leaks. You know, you're not... The, the mud pans, and you see, you know, in California, you'll see on TV where they... 
do a mud set pan where literally they pour concrete and then they pour black tar, hot black tar over the top of it and put tile over it. That's yeah. your grandpa's way of doing it. And it's it's not going to last as long as what the new composite systems are. The Weddies, the Sluters, all these other guys, they have pre-made shower pans. And if you actually have somebody do it, you can get a lifetime warranty on a lot of these different companies because they offer it to their certified installers. So when you put it in there, you've got a waterproof system that even if it moves around a little bit being composite, it's going to hold up and it's not going to, you know, if you've got a house that shifts a little bit or maybe we have just a quick little earthquake or something like that, if you've got just a pure concrete pan, it's not going to hold up if it moves around a little bit. It doesn't take much. If you get a crack in it and it goes through that membrane, then guess what? You've got water coming down into the crawl space, living space down below, and now you're tearing it all up and starting over. And nobody wants to do a $10,000 shower over. No. So I want to see everybody out there using more of these new composite systems out there. They've been around for a long time. They hold up, and you can do them a lot quicker. You know, you'll see a professional go in and spend a day or two doing a, a mud set pan, and instead of having to do, you get the, the, the thing in there, you can get the whole pan pre-made, drop it in, get it inspected, because you want to get inspected, because that's the other thing, too, is they're going to, do a, sh a shower pan test when you have your building inspector come out and look at it in most areas. That way they can sh you can show it's not leaking. Then guess what? Start tiling. Good to go. Good to go. So that's the key with that. So take the time. Do your research. A lot of this stuff isn't that hard to work with. So it can be done, but you're going to have to get a lot of those systems through the tile store or anywhere else. But that's one of the keys is that before we get into how to lay the tile, your grout sizes, all that other stuff, this foundational stuff is solid. So this is what, if you do this wrong, it doesn't matter how you do the rest of it. Now, when we come back, I'm going to dive into uh, grout line sizes, because this is the difference between making a thing look like 1992 or 2020. So when we come back, we'll touch that just as soon as Around the House returns. One KXL. Welcome back to Around the House with Eric G. This is where we talk home improvement every Saturday afternoon. I'm Eric G. I'm Dane Vodder. We're having fun. We want you to join in the conversation here. First off, though, this segment Around the House is brought to you by Adair Homes. Building quality custom homes throughout the Pacific Northwest for nearly 50 years. Find a design center near you at adairhomes.com and make sure you jump onto their website. They've got a grand opening Tuesday night at their Aurora location. So that's going to be a good one. And uh, make sure you join us out there. I think I'm going to try to make it out there for that one as well. And they are CCB number 593. So, all right. We've been talking tile. We've been talking really kind of how to do this right as a DIY project. And this is one of those things that you really, uh, really need to pay attention to because you can go sideways pretty quick. Uh, also, step back a moment. Join us in the conversation. Phone number is 503-417-9595. So grab your phone right now. Add contact. ATHKXL, which is our Facebook page, or you just put around the house and then type in 503 417 9595. Save. Now you got it. And you can call us anytime that we're on air talking about this stuff. Especially all of you listening on the podcast who are listening and go, Oh, I had a question about that. Well, save that number. Call us next Saturday. We'll answer yeah, it. Noon to two Pacific time. We're here. So, all right. So here's the thing with tile I do not like big grout lines. Big grout lines look like 1992. You get that half-inch grout line. Doesn't look good. Now, there are some tiles out there when you're getting with really custom handmade tiles. You end up having some problems with that because what happens is is you've got a variation in size. So sometimes you can't get away with it. If they're off by 330 seconds or even an eighth, you got to have a bigger grout line to make up for that. Otherwise, it's going to look pretty horrible. So I like really tight grout lines on most tile. And again, depending on the tile you're using, that's what you want to do. And if you've got something that's matted, guess what? You've got a little mosaic tile that's on that mesh mat that you're putting in where it's a lot of little pieces, you're stuck with grout lines. You're going to do what you're going to do. But most of those are under an eighth. You know, they're 330 seconds, something like that. So that's a good thing to work with. But you can really take nice tile and make it look super dated by putting in a big half-inch grout line with it. So I like the smaller grout lines for that. Now, 
plan those things out together. When you lay these things out, make sure some tile patterns, you'll put the tile in. I've had one that we planned this out with, and the tile installer did a wonderful job with it. This was, uh, and I'll put the pictures up on uh, around the house, but when you put in these tiles, they're all little segmented. They almost look like flowers. They create these round okay, circles. Yeah. You know that yellow one that I put up on the thing? If you notice, though, it creates a V pattern when you put it in as a big piece. And so when you lay it out, you figure out that you got a V. Well, you want to have that V centered in the right location. So it looks correctly between the two rooms. So those are things you got to take a look when you're laying tile out to make sure that you get those bigger patterns figured out if they have them. And that way it can look centered. So, all right. Hey, we got uh, Mike in Portland calling in. Let's chip out to him. Welcome to Around the House. Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you doing? Well, I have a, uh, a daughter who is proficient at Taekwondo and has a temper, <laughs> so I have some new holes in my wall. <laughs> oh, no. So, I mean... I, I've seen the things where you, like, slap it on and put the spackle over it. Or should I go ahead and actually cut out the stud and go ahead and, and put it in the piece of drywall and then spackle over that? What, what's the, uh, the recommendation? You know, you can get those metal patch kits where they got the, the mesh over it, but to really make that look right, because you're adding so much thickness to it, you kind of have to remove the texture around that to make it look good on that. I think you'll have a better overall repair if you sit there and actually cut it out stud to stud and put a piece of drywall in and tape it and finish it and texture it. But here's one little piece of advice I'll give you as a parent with kids. This sounds like a great daddy-daughter project. That way you guys can both do it together. (laughs) That's not a bad idea. Learn to patch those Taekwondo holes, right? Yep. That way, if you guys get through and do a couple of these, the next time you can just hand her the materials and say, all right, sweetheart, time for a Saturday afternoon project. I like that. (laughs) <laughs> but, but, and how, how do you go ahead what kind of texture do you use it's depending what you how got you what, yeah what kind of texture do you have in there is it a orange peel or is it what they call a knockdown where it's kind of got a texture but there's a kind of overlaying flat surface to it, it it's kind of like an orange peel that's muffled okay it's probably a knockdown a light knockdown where they actually sprayed it on like an orange peel and then they actually take a trowel and go over the top of that and kind of knock the tops off and flatten it. So you're going to go, when you go to the home improvement store, wherever you like checking out, they've got this cans of spray texture, and you can get that can of spray texture and go through there and just mimic that. So you're going to kind of look at it. It's going to take a little bit of a discerning eye, but you can look at it and go, okay, this is a light light texture with maybe a knockdown or it's just a light orange peel. You can kind of match it up that way and uh you know you can take a couple stabs at it the nice thing with it being water you know if you if you don't like the way it's looking you can get some paper towels and knock it off again and try it again all right sounds like i got uh next Saturday lined up <laughs> you too all right mike thanks for calling in and good luck on daddy daughter day hey take care <laughs> thanks you too bye that's a great call right there that's, that's a, a fun one. one yeah it's that's one thing. It's a good time to have the kids learn like that. And that's good skills good, to have. Good skills to have. And drywall repair, might as well. So, uh, kids with drywall. Yep, especially when they're uh, practicing the uh, martial arts moves and everything. Yeah, you can uh, get it a happens. couple holes in the wall. No, I've, I've seen kids that were gymnasts that went a little too far and a foot goes through the wall. I mean, those things kind of happen. So, those are things you got to just be a little bit careful with and dive into. So, all right. Hey, we've got uh, another call in here. Let's go to Ron in Beaver Creek. Welcome to Around the House. Uh, yeah. What can I help you with? Uh, that guy here with the, the sheetrock, I got a little tip for him. If if you cut that hole that's broke, a little elongated, mm-hmm. you can slip a piece of sheetrock in behind, give it a twist, and then uh, screw it onto the other one You know, from the outside. And then you can go ahead and patch the hole without um, adding any uh, uh, layers to it. Yeah, that that does work too. I actually have done it with uh, I've done it with a piece of plywood before. Get it back in there, you know, and, and get one in there and feed it back in there if you can if it's small enough and it's the right size and you got the right, right. wall thickness yeah. to do it. 
Just because I think it holds a little bit better. If somebody was to bump it again, you know, oh, you're not going to oh, bust that's out. True. Yeah, yeah. Because as you know, those uh, those uh, screws don't hold in a drywall very well. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, a little bit. Exactly. But that's a good tip, man, for just doing a quick repair. That does uh, that does get the job done. Yeah. All righty. Hey, cool. Thanks for calling in, Ron. Appreciate you listening but, around the house. Enjoy your program. Hey, thanks, man. Appreciate you. That's a great call as well. That's a good little tip. But I like to make the, you know, personally, I mean, this is a personal choice. I like to, you're already patching it. You're already going to be blending in. I like to go out stud to stud. Might as well pull it all out. Might as well pull it out and do it. But uh, that is a good, quick way to do it if you can get a piece in there. Get it slid in there, spin around the other way. A couple drywall screws. I like to use, you know, three half inch plywood. Gives you a better backer to do that with if you're going to kind of cheat that that way. And that'll get the job done. Yeah. I mean, that's, that sounds like a, a fairly... I mean, if you're looking for a quick fix or maybe even just hold over for a little bit before you can get in and go stud to stud, that sounds like a decent Yeah, decent it'll, it'll get fix. you there. It'll get, get you there. All right, when we come back here, we're going to finish up the show, man. Where's the time gone? Every week. We're going to talk about grout when we come back just as soon as Around the House returns. Welcome back to Around the House with Eric G. This is where we talk home improvement every Saturday afternoon. Last segment here. I want to jump out to our last caller of the day out here, Stephen Tigard. Welcome to Around the House. Hey, Eric. So, first of all, I wanted to give you a, a shout-out. Um, I called you a couple months ago and had some electrical advice, and it was over my skill level as a handyman. And sure enough, I got a great guy out from Rose City, and when I mentioned around the house, he'd said, yeah, he'd been on the show before. Yeah. So, hey, these guys are great. He did an excellent job, and I learned a lot about uh, how to do some things that I will be able to do in the future. Awesome, man. We're going to bring them back here shortly. i got to get that on the schedule here, but we'll be talking more electrical yeah. stuff. But what can I help you today with, man? Yeah, so uh, on the subject of tile, I've got an older home, and the, the tile in the kitchen is like that old 9 by 9 inch. It looks like floor tiles. Sure. And I'm really thinking of taking all that off and putting either a butcher block or a bamboo mm-hmm. on. Uh, there's two countertops. Okay. It looks like plywood uh, underneath it. I think that's something I should be able to do with just some advice from the local uh, home store. Yeah. Any, any comments on that? Yeah, I would not actually do bamboo. Bamboo scares me as a building material for countertops because a lot of times uh, bamboo companies out there, they actually dip that stuff to keep it from turning black and formaldehyde. And so now you're going to have a formaldehyde surface next to food. Not my favorite. That's why I don't even like it for many floor uh, applications because you got a high chance of having formaldehyde in it. And that's just not healthy. Yeah. Butcher block, though? Butcher block, no problem with it, man. You can get that a lot of different places. You can even get it over at, like, Ikea and stuff like that if you can't find it anywhere else. And, you know, just oil it and uh, get a good maple. Maple's a good butcher block material because it's a closed grain hardwood, so you don't have a lot of open grain to it. But just use some mineral oil on it, and you're good to go. Great. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. One secret, Steve, to make sure, take take it down to the top of the cabinets because that's going to be, you're going to get the full thickness stuff that'll be inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Take everything down to the cabinets. You'll take the plywood subtops under the tile out. You're good to go. That's good. All All right, man. Hey, thanks for calling in. Thanks for listening around the house, man. Appreciate it. Ah, great call. We could slide in here at the end of the show. I always love it when people call in. They've called in before. They've gone about their project, and now they're calling back. It's yeah. Great. Oh, uh, thanks for calling out and giving a shout out to Rose City Electric. Love those guys. Absolutely. Looking so, forward to having them back in the studio. Oh, yeah. We'll be talking more electrical coming up and looking at some of our poll questions. It's a hot item. Yep. So we'll be diving <laughs> into that. Now, I want to talk, talk about this before we get out here because grout is a big thing when you're doing a tile project. I don't like using the concrete grouts that we've been using for, geez, hundreds of years out there because there's better products. I like using either the epoxy grouts. Urethane grouts are out there, are, are, are getting better. There's been a few failures that I've seen where they'll shrink a little bit after they've been put in, so you might have to go back and touch them up a few times. But I'll tell you what, these new grouts, if you do it right, you don't have to go back and seal them. So like if you use an epoxy or urethane-based grout, you don't have to go back and seal them again. So then you have a fair, basically a waterproof surface that is much easier to clean than if you use your regular concrete-based grouts. So if you're using the concrete-based grouts, you need to be sealing that probably, depending on the use, every year or two. When was the last time you went through and cleaned and sealed all the grout in your shower or your kitchen? or anything? It just doesn't happen. Then the moisture gets through it because grout is... Well, it's already naturally porous because it's a concrete-type-based product. Water loves to move through it. Guess what? You've got problems and you've got failures. So 
it is can be a little bit harder sometimes to go back and do repairs with it when you do that. But I tell you what, if you put it in right and it's you're not dropping heavy things on the tile or have to worry about and you've done your prep work right, not going to have to replace it anyway. But if you use those better grouts like that, man, I tell you what, you can do something really nice and not have to do as much maintenance, which means it looks better long term. And that's what I like about that. It'll actually last and don't have to worry about it. And you've got a nice, strong grout. And one other thing, too, be careful with white grouts. So many people go, oh, I want to put white tile and white grout. That's great. But if they're using sand or some of these things in there, I have seen white grout not be white. It might have a pink or a peach hue to it. So I've seen that where the, where the material they're using in there, like if you use sand, you don't usually get pure white sand. It might have a little bit of a peach or pink or red hue to it or a little bit of tan hue to it. That can look really horrible with a bright, bright white, you know, tile that you're using. So be careful with the whites. I usually don't use, I mean, rarely do I use those on a project anymore because the white is not purely white. And when you look at all the different manufacturers out there, they have a beautiful long paragraph disclaimer that white will never be white. That, that they're not going to back it up. So, And by the time you get it down on the whole thing and it's dry, you're too late. What are you going to do with it now? You're stuck with it. And once you're stuck with it, you're not going to rip out all the tile again and start over. And you're not going to go through and cut it out, especially when it's that stuff like that. So be careful, guys. Those are some of the tricks and tips to tile. And when in doubt, hire the professionals to come in and do it if you're not comfortable with it. And don't go find them on Craigslist or anywhere else like that. Get the ones that are licensed, bonded, insured, and make sure you get the right people on there. Do your research. Find out all this stuff because you'll be good to go. So be careful with that. We talk about it every week. Get the right people. But that's all the time we got for this week. Our thanks to executive producer Dane Vodder for making the show sound great. John Eric Smith, you're in the Communication Center and rocked it as well. Jeff Thomas, keeping us track and on air. Most of all, though, we want to thank you for listening. I want you to join us next week from noon to 2, where once again we talk about maintenance, repair, designing for remodeling, and renovation your home. Until then, be sure you do what you love, love what you do. This is the Radio Northwest Network. I'm Eric G. I'm Dane Vodder. And you've been listening to, to Around, Around the House. The house. the House with Eric G is produced by Alpha Media USA in association with Design by Eric G LLC. All rights reserved. Copyright 2018. We will be back next week. If you missed part of the show, check out the podcast on AroundTheHouseOnline.com. Remember, measure with a micrometer, mark with chalk, and cut with an axe. Thanks for listening to Around the House. We're out.